So in this video, we're going to look at Euclidean division. Now, this is a fancy name for division with remainder inside the integers, something that you probably learned in primary school. However, it is absolutely crucial to number theory. A huge number of the proofs that we're going to do in subsequent videos rely on this concept. So we're going to spend a video looking at this and looking at the proof of this fact. So firstly, let's state what Euclidean division says. So it says that if you have two integers, a and b, and we're going to be looking at b being the divisor, the thing that we're going to be dividing by, and a being the dividend, the thing that we're going to divide. Now, this is the integers, so it's not a field. Most elements do not have multiplicative inverses, so you can't actually divide by most elements. Only one and negative one have multiplicative inverses. Both of them are their own multiplicative inverses. All the other integers, so 0, 2, negative 2, 3, negative 3, 4, negative 4, they do not have a multiplicative inverse. Their multiplicative inverse is are fractions. So, for example, 2, its multiplicative inverse is a half. 3, its multiplicative inverse is minus a third. Negative 4, its multiplicative inverse is negative a quarter. All of these things are not integers, so they don't have multiplicative inverses in the integers. So you can't actually divide. Instead, what we have is this concept of division with remainder, or Euclidean division. So the thing that we're dividing through by, in order for Euclidean division to apply, the divisor must not be 0. Um, for all other choices of integer, this is going to apply. So it is going to be true that we can write a, the dividend, as some quotient q times b, where q is going to be another integer, plus some remainder. Now, of course, if a is a exact multiple of b, so if b divides a, then you won't need a remainder, or you, the remainder you can view as being zero. But in other cases, it's still going to be the case that you can do this, and the quotient and the remainder both going to be integers. And the crucial thing, the actual useful thing this division property tells us is that it's possible to do this. It's possible to find a Q and an R such that R is one going to be greater than or equal to zero, so it's a non-negative integer, and two, it's going to be smaller than the size of this divisor B. Now, if B is a positive number, then we just put b here, but b could be a negative number also, and this theorem still actually holds true. So more generally, we need to have the absolute value of b, so the size of b. So if b is a positive number, it's just equal to it, or if b is a negative number, it's equal to its additive inverse, i.e. the positive version of it. Now, let's have a look at some examples of this, just to see how this is a perfectly intuitive theorem. This is not complicated at all. This is something actually that you learned in primary school. And then let's think about how we would formally prove this. So some examples. Firstly, let's have an example where B divides A. So let's take A is equal to 45 and B is equal to 15. So in this case, we can apply the theorem because b is not equal to 0. That's the only case where we can't think what happens if b is equal to 0. If b is equal to 0, this bit goes to 0. So r is forced to then be a. And you can see that the theorem might not hold true. Well, indeed, it isn't going to hold true in that case because b is, the, is 0. So you put in here mod of 0. Um, so R would have to have size 0, but it's got size whatever A is equal to. So unless A is also equal to 0, this isn't going to hold true. In fact, even if A is equal to 0, it doesn't quite hold true because it needs to actually be strictly less than this modulus of B. So it's, it's garbage, basically, when B is equal to 0. So as long as B is not equal to 0, you can apply this Euclidean division theorem. And by the way, this is also sometimes called Euclid's division lemma, the fact that you're able to do this. That's another name you might see, or as I say, division with remainder is its old primary school name. So here, A, 45, is a multiple of 15, so we can write 45 as 3 times 15 plus remainder 0. So the quotient is 3, the remainder is 0, so this satisfies this. Our remainder is smaller than the modulus of 15. Lovely. So it works there. 
Let's do another example. Let's take a is equal to 45 again, and this time let's have b is equal to 20. So we can do this. We can write 45 as 2 times 20 plus 5. And you can see again, 5 is now the remainder, 2 is the quotient, and you can see that 5 satisfies this inequality. It's a non-negative number, and uh, it's smaller than the modulus of b, which is 20. Now, hopefully this example, and you just thinking about that in your head, has given you some intuition as to why this theorem is going to be true. So, what you can imagine doing is having, like, the number line of the integers. Don't make me draw all of them, it will take a long time. Um, but we've got some number line here, and you can imagine zero at the center, and this is a bit awkward, but like 20, well, in fact, I'll do it more generally for a smaller b. If we, we'll do another example. Let's have a is equal to 46, let's say, and b is equal to five. You can hopefully you realize that the way we do this is we'd write 46 is equal to nine times five, which is 45, plus one, remainder one, and clearly that remainder satisfies this inequality. It's smaller than five, and it's non-negative. So intuitively on this picture, here is five, and then you can think about marking on all the integer multiples of five, because we're allowed to vary this quotient here and this remainder here, and we want to intuitively understand why it's possible to find a quotient where the remainder is going to be satisfying this inequality. Well, if we think about all the integer multiples of five, five times zero is zero, so that gives that one there, that number here. Five times one is five. Five times negative one will be over here, negative five. Five times two will be over here, 10. Then you'll have five times negative two, which is negative 10. You'll have five times three, which is 15. Five times negative three, which is negative 15, and so on. It will go up to 20, negative 20, and it will go on. This way you'll have 25, 30, 35, 45. And you can see that no matter what A you pick, if your B is set at five, whatever A you pick, it's going to be somewhere amid this lattice, if you like, or it's just a one-dimensional array, really, of points that are multiples of five. Now, it might be the case that your A actually is one of these points, so it actually lands on this subset of the integers that are multiples of five, in which case you can just write your A as that multiple of five that gives you that value, and then it will be remainder zero. That's perfect. That satisfies this uh, inequality. Or if it's not directly on one of them, if it's in between it, then you can go up to the one to the left of it or potentially go down to the one to the left of it. You know, if we're talking about a negative number over here, uh, say we were talking about negative 18, you could go down to negative 20 and then you'd be looking at adding on this small amount, this remainder, which is, of course, smaller size than the size of the number b, because the number b is the length of this distance between neighboring points. So you can see all of these have a difference of 5. So just to do that example, if we made a equal to negative 18 and b still equal to 5, you could write negative 18 as quotient minus 4 times 5. That's going down to this multiple of 5 that's just to the left of your point. And then you'd have to add on 2 to get up to negative 18. And that would, of course, satisfy this inequality because it would be smaller in size than 5. It's a non-negative integer that's smaller than 5 in size. So that's sort of the intuition as to why this theorem holds true. I hope you can also appreciate from this picture that it's possible to adapt this theorem slightly to make the remainders negative. So it's also possible to write a is equal to some other quotient, which I'll call q bar times b plus a different remainder, r bar, where r bar is now going to be a non-positive number. So it's going to be less than or equal to zero, and it's going to be greater in size than 
minus the modulus of B. So the way you can see that on this picture is instead of going to the point to the left of your point A, you'd go to the point to the right of it, and then of course you're going to have to go backwards, so your remainder R bar is now going to be a negative number, or at least a non-positive number. Of course, if um, A is a multiple of B, then you won't need any remainder at all, so it could be zero. But if it's somewhere in between these points that are the multiples of B, then you're going to have to go backwards a little bit, and that amount that you're going to have to go backwards is going to be a negative number, so it's going to be non-positive, less than or equal to zero, and it's going to be bigger than minus b, because if you go back a whole minus b, that takes you to the next multiple. So the amount that you've obviously got to go back is going to be greater than minus the size of b, which is the length of these distances between uh, neighbouring points in this lattice of multiples of your value b. So we don't actually need to view this as a separate theorem. It follows very simply from the fact that this one is true, and I now just want to quickly show you that. So we will assume this one is true then, and we'll prove that later on, and we will derive that it is then possible to find a Q bar and an R bar, such that R bar satisfies this. So what we know is we've started with an A and a B, and we know it's possible to write A as some integer quotient of B plus some integer remainder where R satisfies this. And as I say, we now want to show that it's possible to find a Q bar and an R bar such that R bar satisfies this. So we'll split this proof into two separate cases. Firstly, the special boring case, which is when R is equal to zero. So that's the case where A is an integer multiple of B. B divides A. So in this case, you can just use as your Q bar the same thing as Q, and you can use as R bar the same thing as R, i.e. zero, because zero is allowed in this inequality. So that perfectly satisfies this. So in that case, we're done. Now, let's do the less trivial case, which is when R is not equal to zero, so B does not divide A. So notice the important thing is we can now get rid of this part of the inequality. So now we're just looking at the case where r is strictly greater than zero and strictly less than the mod of b. The way we're going to do this is by just adding the mod of b onto, well, adding and subtracting it off. So I'm going to write this as now a is equal to q times b plus the mod of b minus mod of b plus r. So the reason I'm doing this is, remember, when we go from this to this, really we're imagining going from the point or the multiple that's on the left to the multiple on the right. Remember, the multiple on the left, you need to have a positive remainder. The multiple on the right, you need to have a negative remainder. And really, to move from this point to this point, we need to take Q times B, which is this point, and then add mod of b, we need to go forward mod of b to get to this one on the right. Now note, we're not just adding b because b could have been negative, so if we just added b, we might end up going in the wrong direction because we haven't thought about the fact that b could be negative. Intuitively, with all of our examples so far have been with b's positive, and I will take an example of b negative uh, after we've completed this proof just to go through those examples before we then prove this theorem. But um, B could be negative, so if you just add on B, you could end up going in the wrong direction. So we need to add mod of B. So if B is positive, mod of B is just equal to B. If B is negative, uh, mod of B is equal to minus B. Now, that is then going to make QB plus mod of B this next point here, the point to the right, and then it's going to make R minus the mod of B our new remainder. So this is going to be R bar. So it's going to take r, which was this, and it's going to create r bar, which is this, because we're taking this and we're now subtracting off mod b, and you can imagine that that's reversing the arrow to make it this bit, so that together, this arrow and this arrow make up that whole mod b, except that they don't, because when you add them together, they're pointing in the wrong direction, but you get the idea. So let's think about this a little bit more. If b 
is positive, so let's split it into the two cases. If, um, no, get rid of that. So in the case that b is a positive number, so b is greater than zero, then mod b is just equal to b, and therefore we've just got qb plus b, which we can factor out into q plus one times b. So that makes sense. We're just moving forward to the right by taking q plus one times b instead of q. In the case that b is less than zero, then mod b will equal negative b, and in that case you'll have qb minus b, which will be q minus one times b. So that's a crucial bit of understanding there, that in the case that b is positive, intuitively the one to the right is then add one to the quotient and then multiply by b and you'll get to the, from this one to the one on the right. But in the case that b is negative, then you need to do the opposite thing. To go rightward, you need to subtract one off the quotient rather than add one. If you add one, you'll actually go to the left in the case that b is negative. Um, but the point is, in these two cases, these things will be your new q bar. So in the case that b is positive, q plus one will be q bar. In the case that b is negative, q minus one will be q bar. And this thing will be your new r bar. Um, this is r minus mod b. And this is going to satisfy this inequality. And it's clear to see why that is. You just subtract mod b from this one. So subtract mod b from everything. Remember, we've got rid of this equality bit here. We took that away. So on this side, we'll get minus the mod of b, which is this. Here, we'll get r minus mod b, which is r bar. And here, we'll get mod b minus mod b, which is zero, so it'll give us this. So what we've overall shown then is that in this case where the remainder is non-zero, we can find a q bar and an r bar such that r bar is going to obey this equality because inequality rather, because r bar is going to be greater than minus the mod of b, but less than zero is what we got by taking this inequality and subtracting mod of b from all the parts of it, remembering that we don't have that equality anymore. And this is certainly inside this inequality. It's just the slightly modified version without that equals there. So it certainly satisfies this inequality if it satisfies that one in green. So now what we've done is both cases, the case where the remainder is zero and the case where the remainder is non-zero, we've shown that you can do this. So if this one is true, it follows very easily that this one is true. So before we move on to proof, let's just look at two more examples, examples where b is a negative number. And so that we can use our picture here, let's actually take b is equal to negative 5. So the crucial thing to understand is that even if you have a negative number, you can still generate all of the integer multiples of it. And that actually, this array of integer multiples of it is exactly the same as the array that you would get from its positive version. So for negative five, its array is this exact same picture, i.e. it's the same array as you got for five, because here you're going to have all the negative, well, all the positive numbers times negative five. So one times negative five will give you negative five, two times negative five will give you negative 10, three times negative five will give you negative 15, etc. Zero will give you zero, but then all the negative numbers times it. So minus one times it will give you five, minus two times it will give you 10, minus three times it will give you 15, minus four times it will give you 20. So it will actually give you the exact same array or lattice of numbers on this integer number line that five gave you when you looked at all of its integer multiples. So actually, the intuition behind why this works is exactly the same. If you are given some a, Let's imagine a is equal to, I don't know, maybe 39. All you need to do is, well, either it's a exact multiple of your b, exact multiple of negative 5, in which case it's one of these points. Now, 39 obviously isn't. If we picked 40, it would have been. And in that case, the remainder is going to be equal to 0. Or you're, it will be somewhere in between two of the points in this array of integer multiples. And you can go to the one on the left here, and in this case it will be 35, which is the quotient minus 7 times your b. So we can write 39 is equal to minus 7 times minus 5. And then you'll have to 
add on this positive value, this positive remainder, which is guaranteed to be of size less than the size of your mark B, which in this case is 5. So in this case, the remainder will clearly be plus 4. And the second part that we proved over here is obviously also still true because you can still go to the one on the other side, the one that's above it, the one on the right, and instead in that case, you'll have to come down so your remainder will then be a negative value, but again, of size smaller than the size of your B. So it will be bigger than minus the size of this difference between neighboring points in this array of integer multiples. Just one final example, if we now made A and B both negative numbers, so if we took, for instance, minus, let's do 13, so minus 13 would be over here, so this is going to work exactly the same way. Our initial theorem is going to be true because we can go to this left one, which is minus 15, and then add on a positive remainder of 2. The second part that we proved is also true. You can go to the one on the right, negative 10, and then you can have a negative remainder of minus 3 in this case. So I hope it's intuitively obvious then why these things are true. What we have done so far is proven that if this one is true, then it implies that this one is true. What we now need to do is a rigorous formal explanation as to why this is true.